So, Berto, for the past 14 plus years, people have occasionally been asking me and you, I suppose, to do an episode about Casey Anthony. I have had it on my list of something to look into this entire time, but a new documentary came out on Peacock just recently, and I thought that we would watch it, and then we would make an episode about Casey Anthony, and we would go through the whole story, talk about some new revelations in the the claims, and also we will, at the end, make a determination as to where we land on the most likely scenario. Did she do it? Did she not? If she didn't do it, what was it like? What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and I'm also a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda and I make markerless rulers. So Casey Anthony, new documentary, Peacock, came out. In this documentary, they it's three hours. Pretty good documentary, but what'd you think? Was it biased for Casey Anthony or what? Yeah, I, I actually, I, I felt this is one of the most biased documentaries I've seen. Yeah. It, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there was uh, some deal between them. But Yeah. What do you mean deal? Uh, like she's getting something out of it, some right. sort of compensation. Yeah, real biased for Casey Anthony. There were a couple moments where I was like, is that true? And then I looked it up and I was like, that's actually, they're kind of misleading. Like one of the details <laughs> yeah. that they were misleading about was, if you know the Casey Anthony story, you know this. If you don't, we'll go through the story. But if you know the story, you remember the pictures that came out that were used as evidence against Casey Anthony, you know, that she was partying with her friends right. while Kaylee, her daughter, was missing. And her friend was saying, hey, look, you know, those pictures were taken well before Kaylee had disappeared, and the press and others were using those pictures as evidence that she was partying after the fact. And I thought, whoa, really? Because I re the, right. the little bit I remember <laughs> about this story was that that was the main headline. That was like the, the one thing that I managed to actually know about this was that the child had disappeared and that there was these pictures going around like on MySpace. It was one of the very first cases, famous cases, where they would dredge up photos from the internet, remember? Right. At, as a way of trying to bolster the prosecution. And, and it was a little, a little more subtle even in that, if I recall correctly, the friend actually doesn't say, oh, the, the friend's not the one that says, oh, those pictures were from before. The friend says, well, those were from her 21st birthday. I mean, what are you supposed to do on your 21st birthday? Of course, you're going to celebrate. And then one of the other people said, oh, there's pictures that were taken at different times. And, stuff. and then the net result is you're, you're, led to be, you're led to believe that, oh, wait, those pictures weren't even from that period of time. Right. But that's not accurate. <laughs> and it totally plays into our contemporary notion that the press and prosecutors right. will slander people in this way. You know, think of Amanda Knox, that kind of yep. thing. And I thought, whoa. And then I looked it up, and that's not true. A lot yeah. of the pictures that were of her partying were indeed taken while Kay Kaylee had disappeared. And, and even in the same documentary, she contradicts that statement anyways, because she says, oh, I wasn't out partying, I was working. But right. she doesn't say those are not my pictures taken during that time frame. She right. says, oh, I was working, I was, I was helping promote for my boyfriend. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that because I thought, because that was toward the beginning of the documentary, yeah. and I and I was still kind of uh, getting convinced by it. Now I will say that if the story that is being put forth by the documentary and by Casey, because they're basically agreeing with what Casey's account is now, or at least something close to it, if it's true, then I would say personally that Casey deserves a little bit of bias, not bias, but a little bit of I don't know. Because it wasn't just the information presented in a little misleading way. It just really empath emphasizes the empathy for Casey. Like if if you're watching this, it there's music, there's reenactments, right. there's there's all the supporting evidence. There are you know lots of other people claiming that she's that she can be trusted. You know all just if Casey is even close to telling the truth in this documentary, which we'll get into in terms of what her claim is now, then, yeah, I mean, she was vilified by the public, right. by the prosecution, and she, if 
if it's even close to be true, she is a massive victim in all of this, you know? Right. Uh, it's just that the the main claim from her point of view is, hey, listen, being in jail really brought back all these memories and all these repressed things, and I started really understanding what had happened to me. And yet at the same time, the claim was simultaneously that she purposely always kept Kaylee away from her dad because she knew what was going to happen. And again, simultaneously, that during that period of time where Kaylee was missing, she knew her dad had had her and was afraid of her dad. So it, 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 there, there's these things of like, well, sounds like you already knew this. You didn't like remember this later in jail. You, you were like, we're very aware of this. And, and, you know, of course, once again, to your point, if all that were true, oh man, I mean, let me put it this way. The whole thing is a disaster anyways. What a tragedy. Yeah. From beginning to end, this whole thing is such a tragedy. Yeah. And of course, the biggest victim in this whole thing is that poor little girl. But if, if Casey was severely abused, well, the whole thing is ridiculously tragic. Yeah, yeah. Now, I will say that I don't know, uh, and we'll get into that. I, I find that this story, given the new information in particular, really makes me have no idea what happened. I mean, uh, if I had just followed the news story back in 2008, 2011, I think I would have been pretty sure that she had done something. But after seeing some of the new, not, and not just the documentary, but other data that's actually come out, statements made by the yeah. father, statements made by the brother, other kinds of uh, data that's come out, it, I'm like, wait, it could be any number of things. And we'll get into <laughs> that. We'll get into that later. Also, there's a lot of twists and turns this story, which, you know, I, I, I guess I understand why this why this news story was so interesting to people. And in this episode, I want to this where you and I talk, Berto. I want to provide the psychological angle as much as we can. Yeah. So yeah, as what you were saying, I just want to emphasize this is either a story uh, of a horrific event in which a psychopathic parent, Casey, killed an innocent child, Kaylee, who was almost three years old, or it's a horrific story of a naive but innocent parent, Casey, being railroaded by the police and unfairly bullied by the public and the media uh, for, you know, ever since then. So there's a really horrible story here. <laughs> yeah, but, and either accidental, because the story they presented at trial was that Kaylee drowned on accident, yeah. right? And that her dad helped her cover it up, or her dad basically took over and covered it up. Yeah. And that she was so distraught by the abuse that she had suffered, all these things. Okay, that was the story at trial. Well, that's also horrific if that were true. And then the story she's presenting now is also horrific, which is no, actually, it's even worse than that. Um, all that was a lie, but what was real, real is that uh, he actually didn't kill her then. He like kept her and then later killed her. And he, all these things, right? Like every story you pick, they're all horrible. Yeah, just, just really horrible. So before watching this documentary, Berto, what was your impression of, of the story. Did you follow it at all back then? Um, yeah, I don't know if back then, but there was a point at which I, I listened to all of it, like all the interviews, you know, all the tapes, all that stuff, and watched a, a short documentary on YouTube on it. And so my impression was pretty cl clear cut. It was like, oh, I don't know why she became or was like this, meaning, yeah, like a psychopath. Basically, she, she seemed to not have any ability to care for her child, but even though people are like, oh, she's a great parent. But, and so I thought, yeah, she definitely killed her either on accident or on purpose, seems like on purpose, and then felt free and liberated. And then when she got caught, she, she made up lie after lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And that's what happened. Like, that was my impression. And that the, the only reason she didn't get convicted was basically because the, the defense was just superior to the prosecution and the prosecution's case was not as strong um, to sway the, the jury, but not because she didn't do it. That was my impression. So did you follow the story in 2008? Do you remember? Not back then. I, I came across it later. Like, I don't get me wrong. I remember when it happened, something about it, like, ooh, America's worst mom. But I don't remember knowing the details. I could be wrong, but I don't remember. I, much more recently, maybe three years ago or something, I came across stuff on YouTube and I got interested. Because, you know, I, I got very interested in all those police interviews of killers and things. And this was one of the, the ones that I, that I came across. Um, so no, not back then, but sort of in the last few years. 
Yeah, for me, I had no knowledge of it other than what I had said earlier, just that yeah. a child had died and that there was a partying mom and, and there was some kind of controversy. I couldn't tell you what the result of the trial was. Mm. I couldn't tell you anything. It was happening during a time when I didn't watch any TV and I was way too busy to pay attention to pop culture. After coming on the, after starting, really the podcast has forced me to be knowledgeable about pop culture. People will Mm -hmm. email in and say, hey, you need to talk about this. And I'll be like, huh? And I'll look it up. And then I I learn about that new thing that's happening right now. Yeah. Uh, And in some ways I'm like the most connected to pop culture I've ever (laughs) been in my life. Whereas I've learned a lot of things from you saying, hey, watch this documentary. We're going to talk about it. And I'm like, oh, I never heard about this. <laughs> yeah, because in 2008, obviously I was on the internet, but the internet wasn't the way it is today. And also, I didn't have TV. I didn't have cable TV. Yeah. And, I, and I never watched the news. I never watched like TMZ or anything. So yeah. I was just living in my bubble as a therapist, as a professor. We were playing in a band in 2008. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was, I was going out at night, yeah. <laughs> like almost every night, almost really. So I didn't know. All right. So polls, Berto, what percentage of people in 2011, this is during the trial, mm-hmm. absolutely thought that she killed her daughter? What percentage? Um, I would probably say 70%. Close, 78. Yeah, okay. That is a very high number. Yeah. So just comparing to the other trial of the decade the oj simpson oj <laughs> so in 95 that must have been like 50 50 or something or <laughs> you think it's 50 50 uh yeah it's 67 Actually, wait no no okay wait what, what'd you say 67 67 percent thought they, he was innocent or he yeah, was be, guilty because most americans are white you know what i mean oh sure 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 sure, sure. you were thinking yeah. black white difference and there there was that difference i was yeah i guess i was thinking about it more because I, you know, I, the, as we've talked about before, I was addicted to that trial and things like that, and I just feel like I remember at the time more people being split on it, and that was such a shock to my system because when I saw the car chase, I naively concluded, "Oh, okay, well, this is weird." Like I remember con- thinking while I'm watching the live car chase, "Oh, that's so interesting." Well, I guess in cases like this, they must just they must just send him straight to jail. Right. Like I literally thought that. <laughs> yeah. So when there was this whole trial, I was so confused. And then when he's he's innocent, I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, the trend, though, is over time now, the polls, a lot more people even believe that he's guilty and that he did it, including mm-hmm. black people. Like right. at the time, only 22% of black people thought that OJ was guilty, but now it's double that. So a lot more people have, have been convinced. Um, yeah. How about gender when it comes to if they just go by the binary in the Ooh. in the polls, men versus women? Uh, Ooh, what's the comparison one. regarding Casey Anthony's guilt opinion? Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so part of me would say, okay, mom, you know, women might their maternal instinct might kick in and be like, oh gosh, what a terrible mother. So you know, I go like eighty percent women, and maybe guys might be like, well. Again, I'm being totally stereotypical. Oh, yeah, that's horrible, but she is cute, so I'm going to go 60%. So I'm going to go like 80% women, 60% guys. Well, I don't know that particular percentage, but you're right in that women were twice as likely to think that Casey definitely did it. Okay. And your speculation is actually potentially uh, a part of it. Another angle to look at here is just how much she was hated. And this is all completely... Uh, new information to me. I mean, I knew Casey mm-hmm. Anthony, the story was famous, but right. I didn't realize <laughs> just how famous it was in the late aughts and early tens. So they did a poll and asked people their the most hated person. They asked a bunch of Americans, who is the most hated person? Ooh. And uh, <laughs> who, in 2012, who do you think was number one? 2012, that was trying to think what was in the news back then i mean the end of the world was nigh in 2012 um <laughs> but i mean osama bin laden was still alive so maybe he was in the top of the list somewhere no he's nowhere in top 10. oh really okay <laughs> <laughs> oh man um i don't know i don't remember what was popular but she must have been in the top five she's number one she's number one wow yeah okay number two who else kim- was on the list kim kardashian she was hated yeah why Oh, I didn't know that. Why would people hate oh, her? Oh, is this when the sex tape scandal was? 
I don't know. but Maybe that's when her rise to infamy started. I don't know. Jerry Sandusky, who is really the first oh, person. Oh, yeah. Okay, now that one I can get. <laughs> yeah, he's the first person where, okay, yeah, let him have it. He should have been number two, at least. <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know, Penn State coach, convicted serial child molester. How fucked up is this? That you Kim have, Kardashian is hated more than Jerry How is Sandusky. that possible? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know why, sadly, but that's ridiculous. Well, why? What, what answer? A, a she's a woman, and and, and B, she's kind of not fully white. So I, don't know. I was just gonna say people are stupid. That's that was my answer. That's why, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> why would a dude th that's a <laughs> convicted? But I like it. Just doesn't make sense. And, and his evidence, and we'll, we'll, we're going to do another episode about what Americans believe. It's, uh, a third of Americans believe that top Democrats are involved in a in an elite child sex sex yeah. trafficking ring. So yeah, people are fucking stupid in this. But country. hey, apparently that's not as bad as just having a sex tape out. Yeah, Bernie Madoff, which okay, okay, fine. <laughs> My, Michael Moore, which I don't understand. Jeez, he, he, man, he, he must have had a documentary that just came out. Yeah, right yeah, that is John, so sad. <laughs> John Edwards, I think, because he cheated on his wife. Because he cheated on his wife. Can you imagine? I mean, this is this is just a symptom of the world. Yeah, like you have the top five most hated people. At least two of them actually like really horrible acts right yeah, yeah. um and then you have someone did a sex tape someone who did a documentary yeah and someone who cheated, like, cheated on their wife <laughs> oj simpson okay uh mel gibson yeah tiger woods because he <laughs> right because he, he must that, have been it, around that, that remember time. he had that big uh outburst he like when yeah he had cheated and then he like crashed a car or something I, I don't remember there's some big thing that happened Right, and then yeah. Mel Gibson did had that big racist tirade when yeah. he was drunk, and and then Paris Hilton, <laughs> <laughs> Paris Hilton, yeah, yeah, what the hell, dude? Yeah, uh, sexism, yeah, because you know the two uh, women here, Kim Kardashian, and Paris Hilton, Jeez, uh, literally All the only women on the list. Yeah, and, and people well, hate them. For case, except they're, for Casey. They're, <laughs> they're in the same sentence. They're in the same category as Jerry Sandusky and Bernie Madoff. And Casey Anthony, I mean, at least you understand why people would hate right. Casey Anthony. Right. But. but it is telling that the number one and number two spots are women, Yeah. right? And again, we could definitely make an argument for Casey, of course. Uh, but but those two other women, yeah. they, sure, look, do I care for Paris' shows and things? No. I mean, I watched The Simple Life, but I didn't like it. <laughs> but come on, like that's ridiculous. They would be like my number seven thousand five hundred and seven thousand five hundred and one. Yeah. So tougher bluff, Birdo. The most common perpetrator of child homicide is a parent. Tougher bluff. Oh man, I bet you that's tough. Oh, that's so horrible. Par what's a parent? Uh, what's the name for it? Filicide. Filicide. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go tough. Yeah, it's tough. Oof. But it makes, I mean, it makes sense because like, you know, um, it's so much more likely that the parent's the one that has access to the child. The parent's the one that's stressed. If There are so many people in this world that are, uh, that have trouble, mental trouble, and they have kids. And so, you know, one thing can lead to another. Yeah, well, the other way to look at it is that there are essentially statistically no murders of children you know, when yeah. you average it out over the millions and millions of kids. But there are some. And yeah, they, yeah. so murder of child, children is is very rare. People will, when I say that, people will say like, but, you know, murder is the number one reason. I, I can't, there's a new statistic that yeah. kids, the main reason why they die is because of homicide or something. I can't remember the exact thing. Right, and that's because... That's Kids because children generally almost never, don't die. Yeah, they almost never die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have a very good health system and good good yeah. measures to protect children, and they don't always work. But the chance of a child dying of any reason is extremely low, uh, particularly being shot in a school. By the way, and if, so if a child's going to and children pretty much only have 
relationships their main relationships are with their parents and so if a murder is going to happen then you know yeah it, it'll probably now, the, be the, their parents the flip side to that though is the reason it is so horrific and a shock to the system when there is a school shooting is for the same reason there's almost no kids dying and all of a sudden a whole bunch of kids die for no reason yeah you know? but, but i point that out because when you ask the average parent what percentage chance will your will your child be sh- shot and killed in a school shooting uh, you know you're going to get numbers of like 10% chance or something. Sure, I sure. mean, and it's like, you know, 0.000001%. I mean, literally, yeah. it's that unlikely. Not that we shouldn't be doing anything about it, but because right. we should, because they're, they're pretty easy things to do, like, you know, do what the rest of the fucking world is doing, you know, by limiting the amount of guns. But, oh, well, I guess we can't do that. Okay, so next tougher bluff. 75% of filicides are committed by men. 75% of filicides, parents hmm. who kill children committed by men oh man that's tough um i mean that is a hard thing to answer i uh, i mean i don't know if you're pulling one of these but i'm gonna go bluff because i i bet you it's almost even oh you're right it's uh, 50, i am 50 okay. percent. Yeah. good job there we go the rates of filicide increase with the child's age tougher bluff mm, no i'd say they decrease with the child's age i bet you most are sadly little wee babies because they're too difficult to take care of you're right. You're correct. Forty percent of filicide perpetrators are step parents. Oh yeah. Wait, how much percentage? Forty percent. No, I would go higher. I'd say sixty percent. Bluff. It's ten percent. Oh. Well, that okay, but, well, but that but makes let, sense. But let me ask you another. Most, one. Right. Yeah. But let me ask you another question, which I think yeah. is what you're getting at. Step parents are far more likely to commit filicide when they have access to a child. Tough I bet bluff. you that's tough. Right, that's tough, right. Yeah, so, so okay, it makes sense. Overall, there's way more normal, or not normal, there's way more direct parents than step-parents with right. kids. Right, So statistically, I get it, but yeah. Yeah, but step-parents are much more right. likely. For example, stepfathers are 10 times more likely to kill their Oof. stepchild than a biofather. Stepmothers are three times more likely. Dude. But only 10% of filicides are step-parents, you know, because yeah. there's not that many step-parents around with, young, ki- with young, young kids. The main risk factors, what do you think the main risk factors of filicide are when you do okay. um, studies? Financial struggle is one of them. Like they um, don't have enough money and so... Yes, indirectly less education, indirectly. which is usually associated oh, with I see. finances. Okay. Illness, like the little kid is sick. No, no, no. no. Mm. Why would mental that be? illness from the parent? <laughs> Why would that be? Like, well, because you know it's like, oh my gosh, this is. Co- I guess it's still related to money, but it's also, let's say that you have a child with special needs, right? And you're a step parent, and you are also not well in the head, and you are mm. you thinking this is a, a burden I'm not willing to bear. So there's an easier way out here. No, neither illness okay. nor mental illness is associated. Okay, which is a bit um, of a stigma that I yeah. would like to deconstruct okay other uh, risk factors younger parents mm. and and not married so uh. single parents with little education little hope for the future and they don't have any help they don't have a partner partner with them but again extremely unlikely right uh okay so let's get into the story but first let's take a break what do you say Berto? let's do it Okay, we're back from the break. So for people who don't know the story, I want to just give a little bit of a, a background. So we have Casey Anthony, who was born in 1986. And in 2008, which is where the events take place, she's 19 years old. Or sorry, she's she'd be 22, 21, 22. You have Kaylee. She was nineteen Anthony. when she had Kaylee. Right, exactly. So yeah. at nineteen, she has Kaylee Anthony, born two thousand five. They live in Orlando, Florida, with Casey's parents, George and Cindy Anthony, and they claimed that Casey's boyfriend was the father, but he wasn't the father ultimately. So uh, it's basically just George and Cindy Anthony, the grandparents, and then you got Casey, and then you have Kaylee, little Kaylee, the four of them living in a house. Yeah. So 2008. Um, in mid-June, this is when Kaylee, in all likelihood, died. But we don't know how, but we have many stories which we'll get into. According to Casey Anthony's father, George Anthony, Casey left the family home on June 6th, 16th, 2008, 
taking her daughter Kaylee and did not return for 31 days. According to the father, uh, and then let's see, Casey's mother, Cindy, asked repeatedly during the month. So the mother and the father claimed that Casey disappeared. George claims that he saw her take Kaylee. I, I think Cindy, the mom, didn't know, didn't see Kaylee actually leaving the house. I think that's yeah. the story. And the claim was that she had told, she had said that she was going on a business trip. Okay. And then Casey's mother, Cindy, asked repeatedly during the month to see Kaylee, but Casey, this is over the phone, but Casey claimed that she was too busy with a work assignment in Tampa, Florida. And at other times, she would say that Kaylee was with the nanny named Zanny. And other times Zanny she said that, nanny. yeah, she said that Kaylee was at the park or something like that. So Cindy was just like, bring Kaylee home. Where's Kaylee? Let me talk to Kaylee. And Casey kept making all these excuses. So in all likelihood, Kaylee dies around June 15th. And during this time, there's a lot of accounts from other people, including all those pictures of her partying. And she claims that she was working right. as a promoter or a, an assistant for a promoter, which is totally possible, but it's hard to know. She also claims that she wasn't drinking. She's like, look at the pictures. I'm not drinking. I'm at work, that kind of thing. And to the to an outsider, that might sound completely ridiculous, but, you know, you and I, we know promoters, yep. and if that's your job, then that's your job. And part of your job is to come across like you're one of the party gang, you know? Yep. You're trying to drum up business. You're trying to keep people happy. You're trying to, you know, get people to buy drinks. You're trying to, you know, so, you know, it's- I mean, it's you a, remember- we. We had a common a friend in common who was a promoter. I remember one time I'm like, how's it going? They're like, oh, it's fine. I mean, my little baby has been missing for 30 days, but other than that, everything's great. <laughs> like that happens a lot in yeah. that world. Well, okay. So let's <laughs> let's take a, a, a little asterisk here and talk about the psychology of this. So I, I have a lot of notes, but I think I'm just going to mess it all up by doing what I'm about to do right now, which is kind of s summarize the entire story. <laughs> well, let's start. Let's do two opposing forces right now. Sure. One is that Kaylee, Casey is a known, and it, she even admits it, a pathological liar. I don't think she right. used the word pathological liar, but she says that she's been lying since she was a young child. There are are many stories. The brother is a good source of information. The brother says that, yeah, Casey lied throughout her life. She lied about everything all the time. And the parents would go along with the lies to kind of yeah. enable her because they, they didn't want to confront her. They spoiled her, is the brother's claim. And, and, she, and her story of why she was a liar in the first place had two parts to it. One of them is that uh, she, was, she was saying that her dad led a life that was that was lying which was that he had a job that he was a provider and yet in reality he was unemployed her, her mom was the worker and so she makes the claim that she learned from example that oh okay you just have to like just just say whatever and pretend because that's the way that life is and then as she grew up that was just the way that it was um right. well now we don't know if that's accurate we do know that there were issues we've see, I, I saw many interviews between the parents where there is clearly I mean, he, he had an affair. There, there's all sorts of lying that was happening. For all we know, there was abuse and all these things. But the claim was that she was a patholo she was a pathological liar because she learned it from watching you um, in her home. Right. The other claim, I think, you know, you were saying there are two reasons. The other reason why she said was because she was being sexually abused, raped oh, by right. her dad and by her brother, and that she learned through trauma to just act like everything is fine because yep. that was the only way to survive. What I'll say to that is absolutely. There's a chance that she's lying about it all. There's a chance that she's lying about the abuse. There's a chance that she's lying about her claims of her story, which we'll get into about what actually happened, because she has shown herself to be one of the worst and most pathological liars that you'll ever meet. I've yeah. met them in my practice. And, you know, when people talk about pathological liars, they're just like, you know, I had a partner who cheated on me and he lied to me. He's a pathological liar. And I'm like, <laughs> well, do you have more data to demonstrate yeah. that he's, that he actually would, and it's not a diagnosis, but you know, the clinical label is used for someone like Casey Anthony, who she lied and lied and lied. Even when she didn't need to. Right. So the cops show up 
because the baby is finally reported missing and they start to investigate and they ask her, uh, where do you work? And she says, I work at Universal Studios. Yeah. She's telling the police officers that she works at Universal Studios when she knows that she doesn't work there. And these are deep, deep lies. It's not just, I work uh, uh, at Universal. It's, oh yeah, I work at Universal with this girl, Jennifer, in my office. Oh, I got this beautiful view. And like, like there's these deep layers of yeah. details yeah. to her lies. And she's not a five-year-old girl. She's a grown woman who understands that a baby is missing. And even going off of her story, she understands that a, a child is dead and the yeah. police are going to investigate this and it's it's going to get kind of detailed. And so Although I can't... At this, at this point in the story, though, she would claim that she's still afraid of saying anything because of her father. Right. Right. Which is, I mean, it's great because that... But why would you lie about her, working at Universal? Like that... Because that she doesn't, doesn't know she's... I mean, this is, this is the thing. Of course, I don't believe it. But if you take her side, if you take her story, it's like, dude, I don't know. First of all, she learned how to lie from her dad and her family. Second, she's trapped. She's scared to death that she'll never see her daughter again. Her dad is controlling her life. She's got to say something, you know. Yeah. You I'm kind of worried that for the percentage of people who know nothing about the story will be like, where are we in the story? So I, so <laughs> yeah. that's my fault. So I apologize to the listener. But um, so let, I'm going to derail out of the asterisk and get back to the yes. story so people understand. Okay. So during this time uh, that Casey is definitely gone, but no one has been notified yet. The friends say that she acted like nothing happened and she was just kind of normal. Uh, at this time, Casey, it was shown as she was convicted later of stealing checks and cashing checks. There were, you know, she was caught on video camera cashing fraudulent checks. She got a back tattoo reading Bella Vida or Beautiful Life, yeah. which is interesting. So, you know, her, the according to her, Casey, the love of her life is gone or dead or something. Mm -hmm. And she's out partying. She's acting like nothing happened. She gets a back tattoo. Bella now Casey will say that she learned in therapy that at the time she her unconscious uh, you know mind was attempting to break free of her parents, and so she right. wanted to have this back tattoo because Kaylee being gone or possibly dead freed her or something like that, which you know I, I guess is possible. Casey claims that the dad was saying that he had Kaylee. And Casey was trying to please him by, you know, lying to everybody. In the documentary, this is what she claims. So she claims that dad was a pathological liar, and it's demonstrated that he was in that direction. And there's interviews where he... So long story short, the dad has minor red flags, because there's not a lot of data, yep. that he suffers from antisocial personality or psychopathy. Someone who lies, cheats, cons, exploits other people, is uncaring, lack of empathy. So there's some actual evidence that, because a woman came forward during the trial saying that he was cheating on his wife. And now cheating isn't psychopathic necessarily. But then there's this interview just even a few years ago where you have to see the clip in that's it's it's on YouTube, but it's also on the documentary. I, I think the show they were on like the Today Show or something. When he's telling her to shut up, is that the clip? Right, 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 right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, so, so the they're on camera, they're being interviewed, yeah, and they're talking about the events and about Casey and and the dad kind of knows that there's this question mark out there that people think a lot of people th think he might have actually killed Kaylee and he says shut up to his wife and the but wife said yeah and the wife says you know no you can't tell me to shut up and he and he just doubles down he's like you're gonna shut up you're gonna like he's being uh, filmed and this is his best foot forward so you imagine behind the scenes this guy is he's got to be worse so there's I don't know there's hard yes you know maybe yes. just had an outburst yes and uh on, in the documentary they splice that in to make it seem it was related more directly to being accused of things. It, but I saw like the full interview that that was with. And now his behavior is still like, it's totally red flagging in terms of like, dude, do you like hit her out when we're not watching? Like what's going on here? Yeah. But it wasn't, it was more about, um, they were talking about the family dynamics and it was uh, so, and he was trying to talk and he felt she was like trying to interrupt. Now again, totally not okay to do. But, but they did make it feel 
there were a few things that they purposely did in the documentary to set it up like, oh my God, he is a monster. Now, he might be, but they definitely manipulated things to make it feel that way. Yeah, I don't understand <laughs> that because the if you get rid of those easy, uh, clearly, at least to you and I, moments of manipulation, you have a good documentary on your hands. That's right. Uh, you know, it was similar with, with the Teal Swan documentary. It's like, yeah. you have a good story. Don't screw it up with yeah. obvious <laughs> examples of manipulation because you can throw the whole thing out at that point. Because yeah. you can't, it, it's similar to the story of, of Casey Anthony. If you lie once, no one can believe anything that you say. Yep. And so... In a documentary, if you deceive once, if you manipulate once, if you you know put out misinformation once, then I have to question everything. So yeah, you know, it's just it, it's stupid. It's just really dumb. Well, so the dad has uh, he, the dad has a uh, signs of being a pathological liar, and mom seems to enable that. At least that's what it seems. And she herself was. She says she was a pathological liar since early childhood. She claims that her dad raped her from the ages of eight to twelve. Then her brother stepped in and raped her from twelve no, to she fifteen. Says, she says he didn't rape her. He, she says because she in the documentary says, "Well, he didn't. He didn't rape me, but you know, stuff happened." Okay, and so well, sexually I don't know what that assaulted, means, but sexually assaulted of some in some way. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't but know. I, I, but you know, she's defining it as not rape, so who knows what that means. Yeah, well, sexually assault from twelve to fifteen—that doesn't yeah. sound like just one minor incident, you know. Right, right. Anyway, either she's a really good liar, which is absolutely possible, or a lot of her statements you know, over the last number of years are indicative of something. Because there's a lot of consistency, not only just with her story more lately. I mean, there are some inconsistencies too, but. Um, in terms of what she went through as a child, you know, there's a lot of, but at the same time, it's like you only have her story because she could be lying about it in the same way that she, anyway. I, I so, definitely thought, I, I thought that like, look, unless this was all just like some random genetics, it's very likely she got severely traumatized. I mean, clearly she did in many ways, probably even abuse because at the very least, she was so, and I'm going to use a word here probably incorrectly, but she was so dissociated when her child was missing from reality that, yeah. it, that something was not right in her head. So I, I don't find it that hard to believe that she did go through some abuse. I, I don't know to what extent. I don't know how much of it is real. And that's one of the sad, par sad parts about this is you don't know what on earth to trust because she is an admitted liar. Yeah. And it's not likely that she kicked the habit completely as she's going through this dude you're uh, watching those 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 scenes like i i actually got scared you know how sometimes people say we've talked about this a little bit like sometimes if you're in the presence of a psychopath like you might get like this eerie feeling or something mm -hmm, yeah. when i'm watching her do her what i would call an act because even if even if the abuse is real i i'm like wow this is scary like she is so um superficially convincing but then at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> there's this weird unease in my body. Maybe it's because I know the back. So when I'm she's being it, interviewed recently. When she's being interviewed in the documentary, in the documentary, like they have the lighting and they have the thing and she's so intense and she, and, and there's things that she does. Like, for example, there's one moment where she says, um, you know, but they want me, they, they want me to just like, get on with it. Get on with it, Casey. And I'm thinking, who actually like is someone actually told you like get over it you should get over your daughter's death like did that actually happen because it, it's such a weird thing to say now i could see someone saying something like i don't believe you you're a liar you killed her and you just need to like get on with your life because you got lucky right but i don't see someone saying like hey i believe you i believe that you didn't do this i believe that your child is dead but hey you just got to get over it like I, who who would have done that and so there were moments like that and it's huh. not only one where she says something that is the kind of thing that someone who doesn't quite understand what someone would really be feeling in the moment says, thinking that's what they should be saying. And, and yeah, I got that feeling repeatedly. I didn't. I, 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 and you're entitled to it. But I didn't yeah. get that psychopathic feeling from her. Uh, she could be a psychopath. I don't know. But I, I didn't I, get I'm not that even feeling. using the word psychopath. I'm saying that. And again, totally my feeling, right? But it's just there are multiple times where I felt like she was almost 
she had rehearsed like in her head, okay, and I don't know how much of it is actually literally rehearsed, but it felt like, yeah, this is what I need to say. And then she says it and you're like, well, I see why you think that that's how you should be feeling, but that's a little weird. Huh. I, I didn't, I, I mean, I, 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 I take your word for it, but I didn't pick up on, on that. All right. Before moving on, let's take a break. What do you say? Let's do it. All right. We're back from the break. Anyway, so if the dad is a psychopath, then that can be both a genetic disposition that's passed down to Casey and a learned thing. Uh, you know, people who are psychopaths who are antisocial often have parents who are thus and are and they go through a lot of difficulty and it's often modeled to them. I don't know if either one of them are psychopaths, but at the very least, if both of them are pathological liars, they're at least kind of on some sort of spectrum, potentially. There are other reasons why people lie a lot. Pathological lying can be caused just by trauma, as she claims, which is uh, maybe just potato-potato in terms of psychopath versus trauma-induced pathological lying. But anyway, so she says that Kaylee was born during uh, a rape from a rape, or sorry, and conceived from a rape. She was drugged at a party. And this was another data point that sounded like it was a tick in the column of believing Casey's story, which is that no one in the family acknowledged the pr pregnancy for six months. Now, this is according to her. Yep. So, but yeah. it, it sounded credible to me that, uh, and it was consistent with all the other things of sweeping it under the rug and denying things and just acting like everything is fine when, when right. things are not necessarily fine. The parents are ashamed of their daughter getting pregnant. Maybe they knew it was a rape or maybe they suspected or they wondered about something. And so everyone in the family, the three of them, Casey and her parents, just didn't talk about it. And, 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 and Casey said she didn't even go to the physician until right. she was six months pregnant. Um, and she's like, who does that, <laughs> right? Because who does that <laughs> in mainstream American society that you, you wait that long? And, yep. uh, and she said that she'd be five months pregnant. People would be like, oh, you're pregnant. Because, you know, she's a pretty small person. And I'm, I'm guessing it showed right. pretty significantly Look, at five months. I, I, can, I can believe that. I, again, we have no way to know if it's exactly right. But I can believe it. That there, there was, I, I don't know if you heard, this wasn't in the documentary, but she... So she never graduated from high school. The I last the last six months of high school, she didn't go. And repeatedly throughout those six months, her parents would confront her about because like they would kind of notice something and and she always had a story. She always had a story. But like the week before she was about to she would have been graduating, they finally got contacted by the school and told, Hey, she's not graduating. She's she's been a truant for six months or whatever. And they confront her again. And she claimed that it was that the school had messed up her schedule. And so she didn't really know what her classes were. Again, another story. They threw a party for her, a graduation party. And, and the claim was that she had graduated with honors. So, and this isn't K Casey saying this. This was, uh, you know, and, and another thing I watched said, so it's not her claiming this. Uh, her friends and other people confirming this. So I'm saying, yeah. Do I believe that this family lived in lies and enabled uh, Casey to live in a fantasy world? Yes. To well, what extent? But I don't that's know. Not, that's not just enabling. I mean, imagine being the parents and just straight up lying to all these people. It'd be one thing if you just didn't mention it or you swept it under the, rug, or under the rug. It's another thing to be like in people's faces saying like, yay, Casey graduated with honors. <laughs> Like Absolutely. that's, that's, that's it's, quite it's, a thing, you know, it's really hard you can to imagine, imagine, you can imagine parents being ashamed and going, yeah. Oh, what do I do? What do I do? But to lean into it that far right. and to right. overshoot it. And that's the thing that pathological liars will do when regular people lie, they would say to their friends, or if people ask, they'd be like, Oh yeah, I graduated. Um, I just were, I was just homeschooled or something or yeah, I graduated. I got a GED. Yeah. I got it at another school. Don't worry about it. And, and the maybe, parents might not say anything about it because, like you said, they're embarrassed or they don't want to, whatever. You know. Yeah, they they don't they don't yeah. put a big a banner on the house that says like "Congratulations, Casey." They right. they when asked, they're just like, "Oh yeah, she was homeschooled and she got her diploma because she was just kind of she wasn't challenged very much at school or something." I don't I don't remember it. So yeah. you know, she graduates great. You know, maybe they tell cousins or say, but what pathological liars will do. <laughs> 
<laughs> is they like will double down, triple down. <laughs> they just go full bore. Yeah, and, and and that's why we call it pathological because it's not only problematic. Lying is problematic, but when you're that bad at it and that's that right. compulsive about it, <laughs> that un, unyielding without any kind of question mark about like, well, maybe I should restrain myself a little bit. It, like when so when Casey, so we'll get to the Casey lie in a second for those who don't know. Sorry. Okay, so what Casey claims. This is her story, is that, and it's all laid out in the documentary, is that she fell asleep with Kaylee one night, as she always would, in bed. And remember, Kaylee's almost three years old. And she says that she woke up late because she was a, she's not a morning person. And she woke up. 9 ish Well, she wakes up a little earlier, and she notes that Kaylee is still with her in bed. Right. And then a little bit later, she wakes up, and the dad is shaking her awake, Casey, yep. and says, where's Kaylee? And Casey looks around. She doesn't find Kaylee. And the dad and Casey split up. I think the mom is not home, I think is what. Right, that's the indication. And dad and Casey are looking around the house. Casey comes around the corner and finds the dad with Kaylee in her arms. Soaking wet and not responsive. And not (laughs) responding. And the uh, implication, I think, to the two of them is that Kaylee drowned in the pool. Yeah, and the dad specifically, according to to Casey, the dad saying, "You did this. This is your fault." Right. So this is a quote from what Casey says in the documentary. She said, "She was soaking wet. I can see him standing there with her in his arms, and handing her to me and telling me that it's my fault that I did that, that I caused that." So to give you a picture, the pool was an above ground pool. So it's one of those structures that you need a ladder to get into. You can't just fall into it from ground level, right? right? And Casey claims that there was no ladder on the... Right, the ladder was not out. Right, which would make some sense if you were trying to be safe with a little kid around, you would just That's take right. the, the ladder off. That's her claim. Who the hell knows? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Then the dad, uh, Kaylee, or Casey claims that the dad takes the little Kaylee, the unresponsive body, Dad takes the body and says, I'm going to take care of it. Everything's going to be okay. So that's what Casey claims happened. What other people will claim and other people will think is that Casey in mid-June was so fed up with having a child and unable to party that somehow Casey murdered her own child and then dispose of the body later. So, th- so those are the two kind of main narratives. And, and there's one in between, which is still mostly that one, but it's that she regularly uh, sedated her child with either Xanax and was even using chloroform and went too far. And when she realized she'd gone too far, she tried to figure out how to like make sure she because like she was unresponsive, and then so she tried to really make sure she wasn't coming back. And then she the bell. But either way, but in both of those cases, she was responsible either really directly or indirectly for for the death. Right, right. Okay, so mid-July 2008, Cindy, the mom, this is 31 days after the disappearance of Kaylee, the mom, Cindy, calls 911. She reports Kaylee as a missing person, missing child. She says she's not seen Kaylee for 31 days. She says that Casey has been giving her, Cindy, varied explanations about Kaylee's whereabouts, before finally telling her that she had not seen Kaylee for weeks. So Cindy okay. is like, where's, Case, where's Kaylee? Where's Kaylee? Where's Kaylee? And Casey keeps saying, oh, well, you know, she's, with, she's at the park or she's sleeping. Or, and then finally, Casey just admits to her mom, actually, I haven't seen Kaylee for weeks. And, and re- remember why she even called the cops. Um, Casey's dad went to pick up Casey's car from the impound. Yeah. And when he gets there, the car smells like death, according, according to, to the dad. Well, yeah, yeah. right? But one's got to start putting that together, right? Because if the dad's the one that killed the child, like, why not leave well enough? Why are you going to go find a car that smells like that? What, what Anyways, he because okay, that's going to trigger the grandma to now call the car. So you got to think, what, why would the killer find a car that smells like a body and then be like, whoops, I found a car that smells like a body, even though I'm the killer. Well, and this is going to trigger, now we're going to call the authorities and they're going to get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be in the direction of Casey is is guilty, is what you're saying, right? Of murder. yeah. And so the the grandma find the grandma's like, what? So now she goes and finds Casey at her boyfriend's 
uh, they're, you know, according to her, she's, they're watching TV smoking pot. And she's like, where the hell is Kaylee? And that's when she, quote unquote, comes clean. Like, oh, oh she's been with her nanny and I've been trying to find her for a month. Interesting. I think they left that out of the documentary. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> the documentary and the news reporting put a lot of question marks on whether or not the car actually smelled like a dead body because there were cadaver dogs that had mixed results when they were walking around the car, right? And there was no dead body in the car. It was just residual dead body smell. It's possible that something else died in the car or it was just right. garbagey smelling and, or something. And Casey just left her car randomly somewhere and it got impounded. Who knows? Right? Like it's all coincidences. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, are, well, we'll get to it, but it sounds yeah, like you're yeah. leaning in one direction. Okay. I definitely so, have a story in my head. <laughs> okay. So then there's an investigation actually, you know, cause the cops are like, wait, so there's a missing child. Uh, we haven't seen this child in, in a month. So detectives, uh, you know, start to investigate. They talk to Casey and Casey immediately lies to the detectives in a super obvious way, in a way that is definitely shooting yourself in the foot for the rest of your life, which yeah. is she tells the cops that a story she hasn't told her parents yet, which is that Kaylee had been kidnapped by a nanny named Zanny in early June. And she gives her the full name, the, yep. the, the first, middle, and last name. It's, you know, it's something, something Gonzalez. Zendaya something, yeah. Something. Yeah. And, you know, if you're Casey, and this is what pathological liars will do. It's like, okay, so obviously we're going to contact that person if this, if your claim is this, is that this, you know, if she had said some rando kidnapped my baby right. and I, I didn't was know what park to do. And I saw them and then they yeah. called me and threatened me. Yeah. No. It's she this names specific a, name. A, a, a real human who lives in that town. Goes and points to the specific apartment where they live. Yeah. Goes further, says that this other guy that she is, quote, good friends with has a child that she's also that child's nanny and that she took to his house where she was going to babysit both of them. Yeah. So it's this super, that's why I was saying like her lies are layered yeah. with all these details. And so the cops naturally look into it and they find that one, yes, there is a person with that name and that person is a nanny, but that person has never been a nanny for Kaylee. That, and, and, exactly. that Kaylee and that Kaylee has never had any nanny. And that the other guy she mentioned doesn't really know her, doesn't have a child, certainly didn't have a nanny with the child he doesn't have. <laughs> and the apartment that she points at was... <laughs> is an uh, old folks home. Was unoccupied, actually, is what they said in the documentary. Uh, well, the, there was two things. There was one unoccupied thing. There's another thing, another building she points to that's like an old folks home or a medical for, yeah. for old folks. Yeah. And, and, and this is so, not her... And, yeah. This is not her lying about like if the cops just randomly asked like which elementary school this is the investigation we're yeah. trying to find this child and you're telling us this very specific story of a very specific group of people having done very specific things and it's instantly obvious that she was lying about it and then the other lie she tells is that she's they ask her where she works and she says i'm working at universal studios she had been lying to her parents that she'd been working at universal studios as well she, she originally was working there i think at least she was she was uh, working at a booth in like the actual park or something like that okay but she extended that to she was an event coordinator at corp so she was and she had a friend who worked there who doesn't exist okay wow I'm glad you watched the other documentaries because there's a lot more yeah. damning evidence about, about Casey. And then, so she tells the investigators that she works at Universal Studios. The cops at this point are just like, I think we're dealing with someone that's lying. Because usually they wouldn't take someone to their place of work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or even call their place of work because, it, you know, it's not critical to the case, right? But right. they start to <laughs> wonder like, okay, I think she's lying about this zanny the nanny thing what else is she lying about let's call universal right. studios and they say no she doesn't work here and then the cops say okay well let's try to trap her and so we're gonna go her go to her and say we're gonna take you to universal studios we want to see where you work right talk and, to some of your co-workers and, the, and again non-path the cops see people lie all the time non-pathological uh targets of investigation 
will immediately say, oh, well, actually, I don't work there. I was just saying that because, you know, because a regular person without a pathology would know, well, if we go there, I'm going to be caught. And it's better to come right. clean now than to humiliate myself down the line. It'll get so much worse. But she like doesn't. I, had, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of this because, um, you know, be, be, when I was watching all these things, I did have a conception in my mind of a pathological liar as being this really skilled and adept liar. No. But what you're pointing out, which makes so much sense, is no, 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 no. You, you might imagine, like, you can imagine, like, uh, maybe a mobster or someone who's, like, an actual career criminal or something would be much better at lying because they, they they might say some like i work at universal and later when when he knows or she knows they're being caught they're like no oh i must have misspoke i mean i worked there for a you know like you can right. see them but what you're pointing out is it's such a weird uncontrolled behavior yeah that yeah. they can't even make it make sense yeah let me make let me give an example clinically so i was treating a family and there was a kid who went through significant relational traumas growing up and had attachment issues and was a pathological liar. Uh, I didn't frame it that way, but that's one way to put it. And I would see this often with kids who had significant attachment disruptions when they were young, often around being adopted or being institutionalized for a while or in a, in a string of foster care between zero to four or something. So the parents get home one day and they see that the kid's inside the house and the downstairs window is broken and there's a rock on the inside of the house. So obviously someone threw a rock through the window mm -hmm. and then opened the window and they pretty much immediately figured out what was going on, which is that their, their adopted daughter or foster daughter uh, had forgot to bring her keys to school. And when she was dropped off by the, by the bus, she couldn't get into the house. And so she just took a rock and threw it through the window. And there was no one else. There were no other kids. There were no other people. Yeah. There was there was nothing stolen there, you know, and it, it was just an obvious, you know, uh, what do you say, uh, open and shut case, right? So they confront her about it, and she lies, and she lies, and she lies, and they try to come at her in all these very different ways, and they're in family therapy, you know, so they know how to talk with her about it in a nice way, and she lies, and she lies. It wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't me. Well, how'd you get into the house? Oh, well, I, I had my key. Well, then why is that? Were you here when it happened? No, I didn't see anything. Oh, and then... Hmm. She changes her story to, well, yeah, it was me, actually, but it was a mistake. And they're like, what do you mean it was a mistake? <laughs> and she's like, well, yeah, I got home. I didn't have my key, but I was just kind of walking around the house because I was bored. And I was just kind of like kicking my foot like this. <laughs> and then I accidentally kicked this rock and it flew through the window and then i was like well i might as well just go in the house now because i can walk i can crawl through the window and that's what happened oh my gosh <laughs> and if you knew the landscape of this window and rocks like that it's absurd that that would happen right <laughs> and and she had done similar things in the past you know what i mean right. it wasn't just an isolated event she'd obviously lied in the past many times and so i arrive and i'm trying to help her to break this habit right because mm. it's not helping the situation so I sit down with her and I lay it on thick and I'm like, look, I'm your therapist. It's just you and me talking right now. I'm, you're not in trouble with me. You could literally tell me that you did it and, and, and you could also tell me you don't want me to tell your parents and I won't tell your parents. But it's important that uh, you be able to admit the truth so that you can uh, not get in trouble so often. You know, Your parents are saying, you know, it's one thing that you broke the window, which isn't great, but it's much worse that you continue to lie about it. That's right. what that's what's going to really hurt their their feelings. That's what, what's going to get them to never trust anything that you say. You might get a greater consequence because of their conclusion that you're lying. So, you know, and I'm really laying on thick, you know, hour and a half of using all my skills and all my charisma <laughs> and all my therapy. And, and I'm, I'm just like, you know, things happen sometimes. I, yeah. I did stuff like that when I was a kid. <laughs> I, I did all sorts of things where I, you know, I threw rocks through windows for much lesser reasons than that. And, and it's not good that I did that. And, you know, you're not a bad person. Every, you know, people do things sometimes. <laughs> Um, and she just stuck to the story, stuck to the story, stuck to the story. Wow. And, and forevermore, for the rest of my relationship with the family, she never admitted anything that she had done. Wow. And it's so self no utility. No utility. Right. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. like she had killed someone, right? It was right. that she broke a window. And everyone understood that there were other examples of other kids where 
the kid was literally caught red-handed. Like mm-hmm. the kid breaks into the parents' uh, bedroom and go rifles through the purse and is pulling out cash money out of, out of the purse. The mom walks around the corner, sees the kid literally pulling money out of the purse, and mm. the mom says, uh, "What are you doing?" And the kid will say something like. I was putting money in there because I just wanted to give you this 20 bucks or I was just checking <laughs> to see if you had 20 bucks. I wasn't going to take it. And, you know, most <laughs> kids will eventually give in. They'll just be, or, you know, at the very least, non-pathological liars will just stop talking. They'll just be yeah. like, well, whatever. But the pathological liar will just be like, no, you don't understand. And they'll get angry about it. They'll just be like, I right. can't believe you don't believe me. You yeah, never yeah. believe me. And, you know, so there's a lot of reasons why People will do this. And of course, there will be adults that will do this. So if we're not talking about psychopathic lying, which is often also very poorly executed, but mm. not in this compulsive way. So, Berto, this is going on way longer than I realize. It always happens. I always think, yeah, we'll talk for about an hour. <laughs> we're a ways into this and we're nowhere near the end. So let's actually wrap it up there and let's do a part two next time. We'll publish the rest of it later in the week. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. Okay, and tune in next time when we continue talking about this. And everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.